Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Great pleasure to welcome you to uh, another meeting of the Prague Forum 2000. Uh, when Václav Havel launched this um, gathering 20, more than 20 years ago, um, he didn't want it to be um, an academic discussion. He didn't want it to be a discussion of uh, uh, just current affairs. Uh, he was hoping that this would be a meeting place for people, for people from different parts of the world who were coming from different walks of life, could be intellectuals, politicians, professionals, and who would take a step back from the day-to-day -day traffic of news uh, the, the, the tyranny of the present, so to speak, to look back and try to give their view about some of the key issues, their key interpretation about which way uh, 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 the uh, uh, current uh, developments are going. He had two main topics, two main themes that he was addressing. One was a dialogue of civilizations in a context of globalization. Uh, that is one theme, and in fact, last night, of course, we heard uh, uh, something related to, uh, uh, to that uh, from one of our panelists. And uh, the second, uh, very close, of course, closely identified with this person, was a question of democracy and human rights. And uh, uh, in, uh, that was the legacy of 1989, and uh, uh, 1989 showed how quickly dictatorships can collapse and uh, uh, the uh, enormous hopes that, that were raised uh, at the time. Now, 30 years after, I need not tell to Czechs here, but I think it's true for the whole region, the mood is not exactly uh, one of uh, a celebration. And uh, we will discuss, therefore, the state of democracy today and some of the assumptions on which we uh, uh, were uh, discussing, you know, 20 years ago about the way democracy, 1989, was supposed to be the matrix from which democracy would spread uh, uh, internationally. So uh, the contrast between today and the regression, uh, the, the 1989 and, uh, and today, that is one theme. I remember we, had, we used to have panels about the third way of democracy. Now I see in the program the third wave of authoritarian change. Well, <laughs> you know, that sums it up, so to speak. Yeah. And the second assumption is that the new democracies would find a safe anchor in the liberal democracies of the West, and that this was the way democracy promotion, as it was called, would operate, that the spread, the continuous spread, the diffusion. Well, uh, uh, how about diffusion when uh, liberal democracy and the liberal rules-based international order is being questioned in, or challenged, in some of the long-established uh, liberal democracies. So, um, uh, that is uh, one of the issues we can discuss here, how to account for the contrast, for this reversal, call it how you, uh, how you wish, what are the explanatory hypotheses, and, uh, of course, what are the possibilities of democratic change today? We have just heard that this is not a linear process, that this is a day-to-day, long-distance run. Okay, so this is, I think, very important uh, 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 reminder for those who want a quick fix. I, uh, we have little time, and therefore I will not inflict on you my own uh, 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 readings of, uh, about these questions, but I will first introduce the uh, panelists, and I will not, you have the program, I will not give their biographies, you can read them, uh, but I thought it may be good, since we are in Prague, 30 years after the Velvet Revolution, to start with the home team, so to speak, to, to see the, the situation from here, and then extend uh, 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 to, uh, uh, to two of you, if, if, if that is fine with you. Uh, I will first start with Shimon Panek, because he's an 89er, you know, 
Some of the people think I'm a 68er, if I have to define, okay, you, you are 89er, uh, 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 that's, uh, that's uh, uh, a great uh, uh, privilege to be able 30 years after to reflect. He was one of the student leaders of the time. He has founded one of the most, uh, 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 I think, uh, flourishing uh, NGOs involved uh, not just in this region, but worldwide in promoting human rights. So, uh, uh, you have been an activist in 89, I think you may want to look at, and then we will come to the uh, 2019 uh, generation, and that will be your turn after. So, the view from Prague 30 years after. Well, thank you. You still look very good for 68. <laughs> uh, I don't know, but, thank you. Um, well, what I remember is that our um, image of what we want was very vague. We wanted freedom, we wanted free market economy, we wanted open borders, freedom of speech, association, respect to human rights. But I think one of the problems was that we were not aware that under the relatively well-functioning Western European democracy, to make it simple, <clears throat> uh, under the freedom and free market, there is a plenty of very important, uh, more subtle things, including strong rule of law, regulations, solidarity, redistribution of the wealth, uh, inclusiveness, uh, and, uh, and, and we just had a feeling that freedom and free market will solve everything. And I was 22, so there is an excuse that I was relatively young. But I would say I was very stupid and naive, <laughs> hoping that the most of people will behave and decide in order of public good, in order of better future. And unfortunately, good part of them decide for their own good uh, instead of public good. And um, so 90s, the first 10 years were on other s one side a fascinating time when everything was possible. When we started with People in Need, the NGO which I'm leading now, with aid to the different post-communist conflicts which pop up after the fall of communism because it was like a pressure cooker and including the tensions uh, among the groups, religions, uh, states which were under the lid, everything um, basically pop up so we started to assist in Balkans, in Caucasus, other places. At that time, there was a problem with plane, so I picked the phone and called the minister, and he solved it in two hours. Uh, it was a great time. There was a lot of culture, tens and tens, thousands of artists, uh, scientists, uh, intellectuals coming from abroad to check Czech Czechoslovak society, speed up the... Uh, technological development open to the world and surprisingly few people including Václav Havel and others were able to uh, persuade the society that we should also uh, we should also accept certain part of responsibility which comes with freedom especially for what's happening out outside so Czechs were quite quick uh, with aid and support to the Cuban dissidents in, in Burma, in uh, Belarusia, in different countries around the globe. So it was a great time. But in the same time, I think uh, we forget that we are, we are, as a liberal elite, we are al already keeping the eyes closed to the things which are happening wrongly. And that was the beginning of a certain backslash during the last decade. And even until now, there is a good part of society which feel that they are more losers than winners of all these ter three decades. Uh, and, uh, and, and I like to start with ourselves. I think if we want to re no, not only recommit in terms of words and uh, uh, celebrate, and I still think there is a lot to celebrate, because if you travel to Kiev, if you travel, of course, to Kishinev, if you travel to uh, other parts of Soviet Union or to the Middle East, for most of those countries and activists there, we are the role model as a Central Europe. 
despite all the problems, and I am sure Mikuláš will um, be much more critical, but I still hope that what's happening here, we will be able, also thanks to activities like Million Minutes or Million Moments for Democracy, we will be able to overcome and that the democracy will uh, stay here stable and strong. So it's difficult to subjectively, I would like to be much further objectively comparing with Poles, Slovaks, Hungarians, not talking with friends in the South and East. Are we better in Central Europe to be further or are we better here in Czech? Probably no. So I'm coming back to the words of my father. I, thought, I think it was a Christmas Eve 24th, December 1989. I returned back after six weeks back home and we had a Christmas dinner. I was full of euphoria and he, old former political prisoner, very wise man, was saying, well, take two generations, roughly 40 years, and it might be okay. <laughs> All right, well, that's a, that's a good, it's an encouraging thought because, well, two generations, we have one generation after and he's just here. And so we have one former student activist and we have the current day student activist. And so uh, I'm delighted that uh, uh, Mikuláš Minář could give us a perspective of the generation of today, not ready to wait another 40 years uh, uh, for change. Okay, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm 26, so I don't remember 1989, but I hope that I can say that uh, in 1989, 30 years ago, we wanted freedom and free elections. And today we have <coughs> it, what we want today. Today we want respect for rule of democratic game. Respect to elementary principles of democracy and decency, such as that politicians don't lie, don't misuse their power, and follow the Constitution, which is not always political reality in Czech Republic these days. We want respect to democratic institutions, such as free public media, independent justice, Constitution. But I think the biggest aim and the only crucial foundation of democracy is that we want true democrats. We want political maturity. We want active citizens. Because reason and arguments can rule and prevail only in the country where reason and, uh, and decency are valued more than cheap and short-sighted promises. Mm -hmm. So I should say that in 1989 we wanted freedom, today we have it, and we have so much of this unpleasant freedom that we want some, or some people want some restrictions, more order, some strong leaders. Because, you know, it's hard to bear this difficult thing, freedom, in, us, in uncertain words. And freedom is difficult. And dem democracy is difficult. Because it put, it put big requirements on us. So I think that only mature people can handle this thing, freedom, to their own happiness and to their to our common happiness, and we want, we want to do something for this big aim. Thank, thank you very much, I think, uh, for this uh, uh, thoughtful distinction between freedom and democracy. Freedom, we have freedom gives you the opportunity to make choices, but freedom can lead you in different directions. It was true in 1989, freedom could produce Havel, but freedom could also produce Milosevic or, or, or whatever. And, 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 and of course, uh, that is a discussion we can uh, return to. An interesting contrast with 89. This is not just about discovering of freedom, but we want that the institutions of democracy and rule of law that we created here, that they actually work and that they respect uh, the commitments made in 1989. So this is in a way 
also not just a new situation, but a return to the sources of 1989. Uh, so th thanks very much for that. Uh, I thought it was appropriate to start uh, in Prague, since we are on the 30th anniversary, but of course this was not meant to uh, uh, um, uh, ignore or, or minimize the importance of the uh, international dimension, and we have here uh, uh, several perspectives on that. And uh, I will first give the floor to uh, Tawakasi Karman, uh, Nobel Peace Laureate and human rights activist, uh, if you can give us your view away from Prague, <laughs> how do you see this discussion about freedom, democracy uh, uh, after 1989? First, thank you so much for discussing this, um, this very important issue. Talking about revolutions, something is giving my, me life. Mm -hmm. So this is my environment and this is my struggle. And um, this was always my dream, revolutions against tyranny. I remember very well uh, in um, 1989, yeah, the revolutions here in uh, Eastern Europe, and um, it was, you know, I still remember, and we people in Arab region still remember how was this great revolution against tyranny, against, you know, uh, economist, you know, system, and also, you know, it was how was the street full of people calling for freedom, justice, and democracy. And that was a great aspiration for us. And at the same time, it was a great fears for the dictators. And the dictators in our countries was really afraid of this kind of revolutions and tried to convince the people to don't interfere, to don't discuss these revolutions. It is just an internal issue of Europe, mm -hmm. but uh, we tell them, we tell them uh, in many ways, first in our dreams, that is not internal, uh, 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 <coughs> it is not internal issue of Europe, it is not just exclusive issue for Europe to fight for uh, freedom, democracy and to have it, it's also our issue. And we decided from that time that every people around the world, especially our people, deserve to live without dictatorship. So that was the beginning. So later, in 2011, you see the people in our region, especially in Arab countries, in Arab Spring countries, made the great revolutions against dictatorship, against tyranny, against injustice, against corruption, against wars and against terrorism as well because those dictators are, was and still produce terrorist, terrorism. So we were fed up from all this kind of system, of tyranny system, and we did a great revolution, peaceful revolution in Tunis, in Egypt, in Syria, in Libya, in Yemen. I'm talking about Libya and Syria. Syria and Libya started with peaceful revolution, but though, though yeah, their dictators pushed the people, you know, to, 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 to carry weapons to defense on their, you know, lives. Um, and, uh, and we did a great, great, great revolution, and we succeeded in the first step of this great revolution and we could step down, we could uh, force uh, 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 four presidents to leave the authority with our great revolution. It's just the first step. In Tunis, Ben Ali left. In Egypt, Ben Hosni Mubarak. In Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh. In, in, in Libya, also Muammar al-Qaddafi. And Syria, Inshallah, very soon he will leave the authority. Mm -hmm. And that was because of the struggle and sacrifice of people. But what is current, you know, what, what we are facing now, unfortunately, we face counter-revolutions. And you know, people here, what is the meaning of counter-revolutions. Mm -hmm. Counter-revolutions led by Saudi, Emirates, and Iran. Those three countries are, as they were so afraid from your revolutions, they, they become so afraid from our revolutions for many, many things. And for the first thing is because they are afraid if this revolution will be in their countries, 
if we if we win in our revolutions we will encourage their people to make revolutions against their you know dictatorship uh, 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 regimes but the difference between our revolutions and eastern europe revolution that unfortunately we faced the complicity from the west and from those countries who claim that they are democrat and they support democracy and human rights. Here you find some support from them because they want you to be free from you know, the economic system. But those countries, the Western countries, that they claim that they help and support human rights, unfortunately, they support the counter revolution. They support Saudi and Iran and Emirates on on, on attacking our revolution in, in many, many, many ways. The counter-revolution takes many faces. Coup, military coup, like what happened in Egypt. And unfortunately, the West welcomed this coup. And I, I can't imagine how they claim that they support democracy and they support the CC regime and the, 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 coup, the military coup in Egypt. The militia. Uh, sectarian militia, the terrorists, the incubation wars like what happened in Yemen led by Saudi and Emirates and they s support Saudi and Emirates selling them uh, weapons uh, and give them, you know, the uh, logistic, you know, uh, support, etc., etc. So we are facing this counter-revolution, but still, we are the same people who dreamed for and still dreaming, and still str struggling, and still sacrificing for our freedom, dignity, and democracy. And we know that it cost us a lot, and we didn't give up, and we will not give up. And anyone who said before that Arab Spring die or will die, we tell them, see what is happening this year, in 2019. We have the, th the second wave of Arab Spring in Sudan, in Algeria, in Iraq and also in Egypt. So the will of people to have democracy, to have freedom will not stop, no matter how much it will cost, no matter how much the, the conspiracy. But now the West should decide to be with the will of people or to be with the dictators. And they will lose if they decide to be with the dictators or with the counter-revolution because the future is with people, with generation like this person, this young man, he said, we now live in freedom, democracy, but we need more. So one day you will see our people say that we live in freedom and democracy and we need more and more. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for telling us how 89 created fear among dictators. Mm -hmm. That feeling, how fragile dictatorships can be. They can crumble within weeks unexpectedly. So those who think, what's al Havel used to say, I'm always suspicious of people who think they know the laws of history, you know, that uh, it marks. No. Uh, so yeah, the unpredictability of history, this is one of the lessons of 89. And of course, it works both ways. It works as a possibility of democratic change. Sometimes also, it works in the opposite direction. Uh, and of, you mentioned at the end, this is something we will return perhaps in the discussion and, and, and in other panels, I'm sure, is about what attitudes of the Western democracies towards these situations. Because mm -hmm. when you say they have a choice between the people and the dictator, they will say no. There's the dictators, radical Islamists, and the people there uh, uh, squeezed, so to speak, between the two. And somehow, Western democracies tend to make the dubious choice of turning a blind eye to the dictator. 
in the fear of, but, but you will, you will I'm, I'm sure, have, have lots to say about that. This was just yes. a provocative question, just to, to make... Uh, well, I have uh, a good answer for this. Yeah, you have, I'm sure, plenty of answers to that one. Uh, our, our, our next, but I will first give the, okay. finish the round around uh, with uh, Rosa Maria Paya Acevedo. Great pleasure to uh, see you in uh, Prague Thank again. Um, she's the president of the Latin American Network of Democracy and coordinator of Cuba uh, Decide campaign. Great pleasure to have you in Prague and part of this debate. My Before honor. It's actually an honor to be, to be part of this debate. And I don't want to answer for a uh, tobacco, but my father that was killed by the communist authoritarian regime of Cuba, he used to say that the cost of freedom is the cost of peace. So each time the West made the wrong decision of support what they call a stability instead, instead of supporting the people right to be free, they end up with situations as the one that we are facing today in our hemisphere, the one that we're facing today in, uh, in Latin America. I was born in 1989 and, uh, and but I heard that it was victorious, that uh, for Europe, the perception was that democracy was finally uh, defeated, communist totalitarianism. And in the Americas, it was pretty much the same. Uh, Oscar Arias won a Nobel Peace Prize because of his contribution to the peace in Central America. The national opposition, the Union of national, of national Opposition, the UNO, won the elections against uh, the uh, Marxist-Leninist FSLN of Ortega. And in some way, uh, the Americas started uh, like uh, something called or similar to a democratic period. Of course, the exception was Cuba. And for some reason I, 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 don't, I don't get, the, um, the countries and the governments that helped the process of democratization and liberation in Central and Eastern Europe, they didn't try that harder with Cuba. Um, so that our ambitions in 2019 are pretty much the same that they were in 1989 to defeat a communist totalitarian regime to be able to pursue happiness, just as Minash so beautifully say, as it is, um, uh, as it is our universal human right to decide the way to do it. Uh, I think that to be honest, is the, 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 the world could think in that moment that without the support of the, of the Soviet Union, um, the changes in Cuba were some kind of inevitable. Uh, but guess what? Liberation and democratization is not an spontaneous process. It does not just happen because the rest of the world is changing. And what happened in, uh, in, in Cuba and what Fidel Castro did was to create the photo of Sao Paulo together with Lula da Silva in, in 1990. And the platform of the photo of Sao Paulo was the one that actually helped Hugo Chavez to go to power in 1998 and 1999. And then with the platform of the photo of Sao Paulo that uh, was created by da Silva and Fidel with the money and the resources of the Venezuelan people, they start to spread throughout Latin America uh, authoritarian models that now they call the 21st century socialism. And what we are seeing in our hemisphere is actually a regression of, uh, of several democracies, uh, getting to the point in which um, Julio Borges, the, the, the councillor of the legitimate government of Venezuela, said a few weeks ago that the, that the real uh, dictatorial government in Venezuela is the Cuban regime. So what we are actually uh, facing in, uh, in Latin America is the fact that to 
the, the tolerance that the so-called free world gave to the Cuban totalitarian regime for 60 years ended up acting against the peace and the stability of the democracy in the whole hemisphere. And right now, it's not just uh, a totalitarian uh, regime that oppress their own people, it's also a criminal organization that together with other criminal organizations as the Maduro regime and, uh, and uh, drug dealers and who knows how many uh, corrupt institutions in the, in the whole hemisphere pose a threat not just to the democracy in Venezuela and in Cuba but to the national security of several other countries and it could, say, it could be Colombia or right now while we are talking uh, what is taking place in Ecuador. So that going back to, um, to, the, uh, to the phrase of my father and the cause of freedom being the cause of, uh, of peace, we are right now in, uh, in our region facing a very similar situation to what you are facing uh, right now in, in, in Africa and in all these countries that pass by the Arab Spring. And it imposed the same, the same challenge to uh, Europe, to the United States, to Canada, to the democracies in Latin America. And the challenge is if they are going to take sides with, uh, with the Cuban people, if they are going to take sides with uh, the Venezuelan people, what is, uh, what, is, what is more and more a reality right now is that the way, the road to, uh, to democracy, to stability, to peace in our hemisphere pass by defeating the uh, totalitarian regime in Cuba passed by taking sides with the Cuban people. And it's not longer a matter of being solidarious with a whole population that should be, that should be enough by itself. For uh, our hemisphere right now, that is a matter of survival. Well, uh Thank you very much for reminding us of what you call the Cuban exception. Somehow people assume 89, all communist regimes collapse. Well, f Cuba is one exception. There are a few others, including, uh, including uh, North Korea. And, uh, and China, after all, also remained a communist regime, but they chose a different path, not democratization and reform, but authoritarian capitalism, uh, which is another exit from, mm -hmm. from communist dictatorship that we have discovered after 1989. And it's good to remember that, you know, the day the first free Polish election took place in eight, 1989 was the day of Tiananmen. The two options were there. Yeah. And uh, it just shows the two directions in which we were. Cuba is the third one. You just keep the lid on and uh, uh, wait. We keep waiting. Uh, each time with news about uh, uh, just hoping for the age <laughs> of the leadership to do its work, but that doesn't seem to be enough of a proposition. And what you said about the regional environment, of course, is very important. I, I'm now turning to our, our last speaker, Maria Sandu, who's already gave her uh, a keynote address. I'm not asking for another uh, uh, speech, but perhaps if you have a reaction to what you've heard, if you have a response or a question, uh, uh, what, what, from what you've heard, uh, what is your take on this? Well, I, um, <clears throat> we, we know that democracy is facing issues today, <coughs> excuse me, uh, both in uh, countries with well-established democratic tradition and also in countries which, like mine and uh, like other countries represented here today, uh, which have been struggling for years. And I think the difference in dealing with these challenges is that in one uh, part of the countries, you can rely on institutions and then on people, the activists, those who defend the democracy, and that's for the developed countries and then in countries like ours 
you can't really rely on institutions because the institutions are still to be established and you have to solely rely on the activists. And I remember uh, 1989 because uh, I was born and I was uh, old enough at the time to join the protest together with my parents and with my friends and it was a fascinating experience. Of course, we had all the hope and uh, we could not imagine that 30 years later uh, we would still uh, fight for these freedoms and that we would be that poor. But that's a different story. Uh, what I want to say is that, and I said this in my speech, it's extremely difficult when you have this opportunity to uh, deliver on freedoms and democracy at the same time to ensure uh, good economic development. Because in many of the countries, I think, even after the Arab uh, Spring, uh, the economic hardship actually uh, did not allow these countries to continue on, on their uh, democratic tra trajectory. And it, of course, it's difficult when you don't have institutions. This is what happened to us. You didn't have, you had a very weak uh, state. We had a very weak state which couldn't defend the people, which could not create opportunities. And then at some point, some people um, will start questioning democracy because in Moldova, even though we have a critical mass of people who believe in democracy, and that's why we succeeded to fight all these authoritarian uh, regimes, but there are still people who believe that democracy is to be blamed for corruption, for uh, poverty, for migration. Uh, there are still people who believe that you need a strong hand to come and to bring order to the country. So this is the challenge for, for, for our countries to, when, when you pursue democratic values, to somehow make sure that you deliver on the economic uh, programs and of course for that you need to have good governments and this is where I have a, where I have a reaction um, to uh, Mikolaj, is it? Uh, because he said that we need good politicians and I can tell you there won't be good politicians unless good people will try to become politicians. Exactly. It's extremely difficult. I didn't mean to become politician. Uh, I had very bad opinions about politics because politics in my country has always been dirty and messy. I never wanted to become politician. But at some point, when I realized that everybody was uh, corrupt in Moldovan politics, that we've been waiting for 25 years to see one decent political party, and we just couldn't see it, we decided that we, we had to try and we had zero money and we had zero political experience and we just said let's try and unless you get decent people, honest people to want to become politicians, you're not gonna uh, get to the point that you want. So uh, my advice is it's, uh, try it, it's very hard, it's extremely interesting, extremely interesting. So uh, <laughs> and, and it might be rewarding. Thank and you. it might be rewarding. So what we are trying to do when we don't have yet institutions, and I'm very committed to building institutions, but I don't know how much time I'll have in the office. Not and much. then uh, one of my Harvard professors uh, writes that, you know, you need, uh, for some countries, you need 70 years to build sustainable institutions. <laughs> so I definitely don't want to have this. But uh, what we can do is work on education, uh, because this is about... Uh, developing activists, young generation who want to continue the fight of the 1989 generation. We are going to work, we are trying to work with diaspora, yeah. which is again uh, pro-democracy. And these are the things that we've been trying to do. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. Okay. Uh, our time is short and uh, I, I would first start asking if any of the panelists have questions to each other. That may be uh, uh, one. I, I have questions and then we also have a chance perhaps to ask questions from, uh, from, uh, from the audience. So first take, do panelists have, uh, from what they've heard, a uh, question to, to each other? Uh, uh, well, I see already one theme coming to you. There are several civil society representatives here. Uh, one went into politics, uh, others perhaps may consider it. 
Shimon decided otherwise so far. Uh, so wh 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 what about this issue of connecting civil society with the political society? If we complain about the stalemate that has appeared in the political class after 89 in Central Europe, what, how to renew, how to change the situation? Well, you hardly can, you know, turn the clock back. <laughs> so uh, we hope that here basically most of the things are done by the D-Day, which was the fall of communism, and that the real problems are in more difficult places like Balkans, Soviet Union, later on Asia and Africa, and it was of course a mistake. Again, I, I think it was my biggest intellectual, intellectual nonsense in my life. Um, but you can't turn it back, so we, we are where we are in different positions, but I just wanted to react very quickly to both you mentioning that we from the West and should stay more with the people, not with the, with the elites and sometimes authoritarians, but as you can see, we are struggling as well in the West last few years. And I think it's very much up to us on, a, let's say, probably mainly people <coughs> who trust in a liberal democracy who are in the last few years more on the defense mode, often pushed by the populists, by the more conservative groups, by the extreme groups. And I sometimes have a feeling that we doubt about our values and principles, that we try to somehow sneak through the different times, that we try to hide a little bit to, ten, to sensitive teams like a fight for human rights somewhere under the more vegetarian type of the works like uh, general development or whatever. And I think this is the ultimate mistake because if we want to defend the liberal values in our societies and still be a role model and be some, someone who can be helpful and support, not export, but support you because after all, it's your own fight yeah. in your mm -hmm. country. We can't export it, we can't support you. We have to be strong and firm, and I would say stronger than before mm. when the things were almost for granted. Now there is a struggle uh, in our countries around the liberal values, and who then us should be stronger than before and fight for that for our countries, but also for our colleagues and friends in the countries where democracy and freedom doesn't reign, because without that, we won't be any more able to support them. Mm -hmm. So that's my note, mainly to us here, uh, and as a person from civil society, I think this is our main homework now, not to be on the defensive, but to be really firm and strong, mm -hmm. fighting for our values. Because other side try, they push, and how much will we will allow them, they will gain. It has to be a, a simultaneous yeah. process. I, it, it, I know it's difficult, but in, it, it has to be simultaneous the, uh, uh, because authoritarians, they are counting with your problems. They don't have to win elections. They don't have to explain themselves to the people. They don't have to, to uh, they, they are not held accountable. So the, uh, they have, in, in the case of, of the Cuban regime, they have been there for 60 years. Yeah. They have seen everything that took place in Europe and they have took part in some of the problems also. So of course, of course that each country has its own problems, each region has its own problems, but uh, there, are some, uh, there, there are some crises that can just not be put on hold and that requires the support of the international community. Of course that it is our problem. Of course that is the Cuban people problem and we are not going to stop fighting. I mean, the, what we are talking right now, there are 120 political prisoners yep. and thousands of arbitrary detention taking place each year in my country. The same scene or worse in Venezuela. I mean, people never stop fighting and that's something that probably totalitarians didn't count on, and is that 60 years after, yeah. we are still fighting. But um, Arab Spring, Tiananmen Square, Venezuelan struggle, just prove that people on the streets is not enough. It's necessary, 
but it's not enough when you have criminals in power willing to use the tanks over the bodies of the, uh, of the, of, of the citizens. So we just have to find a way to be functional and, uh, and to add as a, as a close or at least as a coordinate force against the authoritarian threat. I want to add something. Yes. That when uh, we blame West, it, yeah. I've just been handed a okay. note and, quick, okay. uh, and, and then I'll ask one question okay, from the audience. I want to add something. When we blame the West, we blame the regimes, the administrations, not the people, not the media, not the NGOs. We have a great yeah, support and from Czech all Republic of the Republic. Thank you, thank you, thank mm -hmm. you for all the people around the, the world, special pe people in the West. And I want to say something about radical Islam is the alternative when the democracy is this is very dangerous point and we shouldn't blame democracy when the result beca became something that western government doesn't like and we shouldn't blame democracy when it produced a president like trump in the united states we shouldn't blame democracy when produce right wing extreme right wing people uh, 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 in, in the Western, uh, in some Western countries. So we should give the people the chance to choose who they want. And then at the end, they then, they will not choose them. In Tunis, for example, it's very important example for what is, what was the sin if, if the democracy prevail in, in, in Egypt, in Yemen, in, uh, in, in, in Libya, in, uh, in Syria, if Bashar al-Assad lived. In Tunis, now who won the election? Is new president Qais and an Islamic party failed? And this is democracy. Giving the, those, any movement from right, from left, give them the chance to compete, to compete in the election. Don't push them to be extremists. Don't push them to be terrorists. Don't push them to use violence as alternative to, uh, cho choose. Don't put them in the prisons so that you said we are afraid from. So let the people cho choose their destiny and their rulers. And one day they will leave the authority. That's exactly what happened in Tunis and big gratitude to Tunisian people that now that gave the evidence to the world, to the West government, that the alternative is not the military coup, is not the militia, is not the terrorism, is the democratic people and is a president like the current president of Tunis, Qais. He is not belong to Islamic movements and he gave the big, big, big evidence. Okay, well, uh, certainly Tunisia from the what was called the Arab Spring. Tunisia is the only hopeful case that is always singled out and deservedly so, and it shows that it is possible, and, and, yeah. and, and indeed. I, we've run out of time. I, I wanted to have at least one question from the audience just to prove the spirit of 89 is still alive. <laughs> uh, so please, is there somebody with a one quick question, not a speech, yes. Uh, uh. Mm -hmm. Oh. So the issue about fragmentation of us, I don't know who wants to take that I one. You that. have united all the people on, on yeah, that. Definitely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we should think about it and we should uh, be creative because maybe we are challenging and facing two problems that were not here uh, before uh, ago at the time. So we, we, should, uh, uh, we should be creative and find some new, new yeah. ways and new solutions to this problem. Thank you for being brief. I've just got a second note saying my 
our time is up. I, I will therefore not try to summarize our discussion, make some conclusions. Uh, I think it is interesting that 30 years after, here in Central Europe, we are not reflecting in a very triumphalist mood about uh, uh, democracy. We just show the commitment to what was achieved then and how to preserve it and how to develop it. Uh, how important the institutions of the rule of law are to do so. There is a question of economic conditions and inequality that was mentioned, fragmentation of our societies. That is a major challenge for our societies, the underpinnings of, of, of democracy. The question that you represent, how to renew the political society if civil society is in total disconnect. So this, this is, I think, this was the question Václav Havel was asking. That was his question. You cannot build democracy without direct connection with civil society. That was his main motto, and that was his main... Uh, people were calling it anti-politics, he doesn't believe in traditional parties. No, he, he said simply you have to connect civil society with, with the political parties, with the political system, and that has not been happening. Perhaps your generation will be a, a, a better equipped at that. And finally, you know, Western democracies, it has been mentioned, have their share of responsibility in the future. Uh, uh, they have their own difficulty inwards. And uh, the whole debate about democracy promotion, I think, has two flanks. One is, uh, look at our situation. Uh, not easy to promote democracy if you're not doing well democratically. So democracy promotion always begins at home. <laughs> but secondly, <laughs> you must not forget your commitment as a democracy to spreading those values and to sharing them under different circumstances, not by force, not exporting by force, but helping those who are fighting for democracy. Some of them were present around this panel. Thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.